shooting a TV show. You could be eating a cake with someone. Like, doesn't it feel like another planet? <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it sounds like a novel. It sounds yeah. like a magical, you know, a fantasy novel or something. Or, and it's the good, the good side of Twitter, right? Not mm -hmm. the dark side. It's the mm -hmm. bright. Um, we, so we started to chat on the phone the other day a little bit, and, and then we decided to save the conversation for here. But I asked her, because my, my husband's a writer too, and I know that in his work, um, sometimes a person from his life will inspire a character, or a character might be an amalgam of several people, or it might be he himself, or something like that. And I'm always interested in that. I wanted to ask Taffy, was the Toby character, the Libby character seems to be very clearly based on Taffy, and um, from what I know about you. And, um, but I wanted to know about Toby, Toby Fleischman. Where did he come from? So, so when I turned 40, a lot of my friends started telling me that they were getting divorced. And they all had a very similar story about why they were getting divorced, about how midlife was treating them. And when I decided that it should be a story told through a male perspective, I thought of a couple of things. Number one, what I wanted was a way in which a person could pick a profession and that profession can kind of backfire on you, which is how I feel as a journalist a lot, that like, you know, you're promised security if you're good at your job. And I don't know a journalist who feels secure in their job anymore, but he's a doctor. And I thought it was interesting that when I was growing up or when Toby was growing up, since we're the same age, he would choose to be a doctor because that was a successful money-making career and it isn't anymore. So the idea that like the ground just shifted under his feet in his marriage, in his career, in everything, that was the thing I wanted to bring. So I know a lot of doctors. I grew up in New York. I went to a Jewish day school. I went to NYU. In creating a short Jewish specialist who lived on the Upper East Side, it was the least specific character I could think of, which is so funny because I have a lot of friends who are, George, who are short Jewish specialists on the Upper East Side. <laughs> and I get, a, I get this question all the time especially from people in New York. Oh, I think I know the guy you based Toby Fleischman on. And they'll give me the name of somebody and I've never heard of that person. And sometimes they'll give me the name of somebody and I have heard of that person. Um, it's been a very strange phenomenon. And while when I was, before I wrote a novel, I would have said, I remember I interviewed Jonathan Franzen and I asked which of the characters in the corrections is him. and I didn't understand at the time that it's not that like, is Libby me? Is Toby that guy? It's that they're all me. And I'm just so relieved that people think that I'm Libby and not Rachel. <laughs> well, I mean the superficial details about Libby. The superficial um, details, right. Because those are yeah. easy for me. Cause I could talk easily from a point of view of being a magazine writer and I could take a specialist and I know that medical, medical drama has unending kind of beautiful metaphor in it. And oh. Toby is a liver specialist whose wife leaves him, whose ex-wife, whom he's recently separated from, one day drops the kids off and doesn't return. And he is working on a case at work um, with a... Um, with a patient who has Wilson's disease. And the thing I love, love when I, I love about Wilson's disease, Wilson's disease, it's a horrible disease, I don't love it. But the, when I found it, the thing that set me on fire about it was that um, Wilson's disease is something you could have detected early because the first sign of it is a copper ring around a person's iris. And so for people to not have noticed that her eyes had changed, that the patient's eyes had changed, meant that nobody was looking very closely at her. So Toby is a lot of different people. He's a bunch of ideas, kind of a, a golem of ideas and stories that I've heard. 
but mostly he exists to be a kind of newly middle-aged but still young guy who is who is sowing his oats i think that's the cliche is it like who is who is getting around who is doing what he hasn't done in a long time and having a great time doing it but i do have a lot of friends who say to me you could have made him a little more different <laughs> what does that mean though I, that means that like if if you know if you if people know you know me and you are a short specialist on the upper east side perhaps people could also infer that you maybe lightly you know sexually harassed someone at work or are like rabidly pursuing sexual exploits things that people might might want to keep to themselves <laughs> Well, that was another thing that struck me straight away. Well, first of all, the, the idea also about why I presume to say you're Libby is that the, the book turns out to be told in first person, the narrator, but it's kind of revealed what I thought a little deeply in. It's like page 13 or something in my copy, in my right. hymnal. <laughs> and, it's, um, and I was like, oh, oh. And, I, and so then I started looking at it sort of through her lens, but I didn't know who she was yet. So it was this very interesting uh, way to make that character um, fascinating. You're just dying to know more about her because... Oh, that's good. Yes, it's an interesting little sneaky way to do that, I thought. Um, not that you were maybe conscious of that, but that I thought that was clever. Um, also, I just was struck by how, um, it, how much sexuality there is in the book and how his... The main character, Toby Fleischman's um, sexuality, seems to be so accurate and well observed and described. And you're obviously a woman, and he's a cis male kind of, you know, cisgender type guy. Right. And it, I was struck by that. And that's, um, I've heard you uh, make, you know, people make comparisons between like um, the humor in Portnoy's Complaint or, or Philip, you know, um, Right. Goodbye, Columbus, and and I thought of those books too when I was reading it because oh, but the nice. novelty for me was just that this young woman had written this and got it so right, and I thought that I mean I imagine you got it right. I'm not a man. I know. I hope I did. I, you know, and it's so much a big part of it. It's so unabashed. Right. And that I just was so impressed. And thank you. In, in acting, we have a thing we say: um, acting is observing. Mm -hmm. So. And I think writing, obviously, is the same. And the acting in your book is very good. It's very well observed. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I worked at GQ for four years. And before I worked there, I'd been trying to work there. And so I read everything that they put out. And I began to speak in their vernacular. Like, I knew that I wanted to be... To, when I started writing for GQ, and I think 2000... 13 or 14, I was, I like, I wanted to have a career writing there because it seemed to be one of the last places that a writer could really just be a writer. And um, whereas, you know, I was also working at the New York Times Magazine, which was a little bit more buttoned up. It's not anymore. It's actually hewed a lot more toward a voicier thing lately, the magazine. Um, but I, I knew how, I knew that the only way that you could survive at a place like that was to really take on the voice of a man. And so that was very scary to me at first because I was mostly writing about men and I was very comfortable writing about men because writing about women was a, I don't know if it made me uncomfortable if I would impose myself too much on them. I could hear a man's story more clearly because it had nothing to do with me. Hmm. And I, I just loved doing it. It was, it was, it felt easy for me and it felt so free to be able to write in a man's voice, to be able to not apologize for everything that you're thinking and that you're saying. Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want that? I, I like, I loved writing about men because I, I did not have, there never seemed to be a barrier between the story, the story and the man. There was no, there was no insecurity. There were, 
there was just a kind of boldness. And I think that maybe I learned a lot from that in terms of not just writing, but to live in a certain way. Like, why don't I get to live like that? You know? Yeah. And don't you say, or Libby say in the book that, um, says in the book that she, when she would interview, um, male subjects as opposed to female subjects, mm -hmm. um, she might actually get a sense of their whole soul because yes. it wasn't just uh, yes. where they, what their angle was of how to fit into society. Right. But if you actually their experience it, of life. And their, yeah. If you think about it, if I were to interview a woman, not an actress, because actresses have, have always been as necessary to a product as actors. But if I were to interview a female creator, so many of them, especially 10 years ago, I don't know if it's the same now, but so many of them have the same kind of aggressiveness to them because they had to, because that was the only way they could become people. Because, you know, you're married to a writer. Writers are people who are always willing to assume that they've done it wrong or that the thing that they wrote is terrible, right? Like I, I am willing to believe that anything I wrote, no matter how I feel about it, could be deemed by the greater public as terrible. Um, I, I don't Gosh, think, you what? Sound so sure. Your voice sounds so assured. I, I know because I'm like tap dancing as fast as I can so that nobody, because <laughs> then nobody, if nobody sees the like the holes in it, I know it seems that way, but that's like part of the trick. But the women, like the men I interviewed, I mean, I just read a profile of Charlie Kaufman, the screenwriter, in the Times Magazine, and he is allowed to be, be like so insecure. Like his whole persona is that he's fragile and insecure. And I can't think of a woman who is allowed to seem that way and also get a profile written about her. Yeah. And that's like a, still an outstanding issue. But I got like the fact that. I got to write about people who had no questions about whether or not they belonged at the table, it taught me everything I needed to know about how to seem like you should be seated at the table. Right. That makes so sense. When you, so when you write a, a part like Toby, yeah. you, or you write a part about a male character, you write a male character or a perspective of a male character, is that that Trojan horse idea that yeah. you're, yeah. That like, if I write, okay, so in an interview, for example, you, the conversation and, and what Jay is talking about for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, which is presumably is a lot of you, um, <laughs> is the, is, is that the character Libby, who is the narrator of the book, has recently left her job at a men's magazine and is now a stay-at-home mother. And she is telling the story of a friend of hers who was recently divorced and whose wife drops off the kids, et cetera, et cetera. And she, um, she is really struggling throughout to try to figure out what her place was as a writer now that she doesn't need the money as much and she doesn't really know what to do. And she's kind of um, processing the experience she had as a woman at a men's magazine. And the book is kind of a meta commentary on that, which is that she never felt entitled to tell her own story because men's stories were the ones that were the most valued. So in the end, she the story builds and she gets to tell more and more of her story. And at one point she talks about how she used to write a story about um, a, a man, which is she would tell his story and she would put herself in at the end and she would tell the parts of his story that were most telling of her own experience and she would apologize for nothing. And that was how she was able to put her story out into the world. And it was very gratifying to have people reading stories that seemed to be about these men, but were really about her. Well, that's one of the hallmarks of the novel, too, is this wonderful, um, oh, almost uh, 
profound way that the, the uh, perspective shifts, like that idea that you realize the narrator is Libby, right. sort of deeply into the first chapter. Um, and then there's another really profound uh, revelation, the perspective yeah. shifts. And it's an interesting take on this uh, sexual politics of this that you're talking about, but also about um, uh, marriage, how marriage works. Um, uh, it's <laughs> Rashomon kind of thing of like he said, she said, and it's sort of magical how you make that work. I mean, it's really like when you get to, I don't, I'm not going to give anything away, but when you get really deeply into the book, I remember just dropping the book. Like, being really? like yes, when I got to like part, part four or whatever it is and just being like, oh, whoa, <laughs> yeah, really exciting. That's great. Um, Thank you. Talk a little bit about your process. Like, when you, when, so you were saying this about you just go so that you don't, aren't self-conscious. Right. I have noticed since I've known you, you have written this while writing your magazine pieces. Right. She just published a short story of kind of a sequel to um, Fleischman in The Cut, the New York Magazine's The Cut. Uh -huh. I've just read it today. And um, then she wrote the screenplay because this is going to be made into a, how many parts? Oh, a TV show, nine, nine episodes so far, we think. Excellent. Yes. On, on which um, platform? FX. FX. It's FX on Hulu, I think. Hulu, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, and, and has written a new book. There's a new book coming, a new novel. There's a new book. I handed it in two weeks ago. So my husband, for instance, does not write that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Like your husband is no slouch, so no, you know. I know. I'm so, but I'm just saying he tends to gestate about an idea a long time, and you did. I mean, a fair amount of research, I think, on hepatology and on uh, I don't know those dating apps. Did you make all that up or no? I made. Up? I'm. I looked at a lot of my friends' phones, <laughs> and I, um, you know, the research really was. I have friends I've been doing this for years where I'd call them up and I'd say give me a liver disease where if people had been thinking about if people had been looking closer they would have known like give me one that has like a subtle outward thing like also in my in my new book which is not available for purchase and is not even edited um yet in my new book um I, there, there's a woman in there that's very vain. And so the disease she dies from is that I, I called up a friend and said, is there a disease that makes you look better before it makes you look worse? And I found out there's a disease that flood, like where you, fluid floods your lymph so that your skin puffs out and you, you don't look wrinkled anymore. If you're, it, and it's for people who are, people who are in their 60s and 70s get it. And so at first they think, it, people think they've had plastic surgery and they think it's a miracle, but in three or four months they die from it. It's like, it's a sclerosis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's terrible. It's like all diseases, it's, yeah. it's terrible. Okay. That's why it's called a disease. Um, but, but uh, you know, it's, to say I did research, makes it sound fancier than it actually is. It's just more calling people who went to better schools than I did <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and asking them questions. But yeah, my process is to go very, very fast so that I can't stop and think. Because if you stop and think while you're doing this, the, the question that, uh, that invades your head is like, who asked for this? Like, nobody needs this. Who yeah. wanted this? And it's easier with a magazine story where you know that the New York Times has to have a certain amount of stories in it every single day. And I am an employee of the New York Times. But a novel, like book, Warwick's is full of novels. Like these mm -hmm. things already exist. And if you stop for long enough to think about it, you might, you might really stop doing it. And then it's a waste of time. And the one thing, excuse me, the one thing I cannot bear in my life is wasted effort. Like, I, like if I, I can't cook and I never learned how because every time I try to make something, if I burn it, I'm despondent. Like, it's as if it didn't happen. And my husband always says to me, my husband who's very interested in me learning how to cook, says to me, <laughs> says to me this is how you learn. And I can't bear 
that I would have wasted that there would be a hundred pages of a book I wrote that didn't get finished. Like I just, it's just not in me. I'm too practical. Um, and this last book that I wrote, I also wrote very quickly because it is, it is, it was like, it was like holding my nose and going under because, because Fleischman, you know, Fleischman did, people liked it. Um, at least the people I've heard from, which I was very, very lucky for. And it's very hard to do something after the thing people liked. And yeah. so I, I wrote the second book almost to exercise myself of it, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make it, because I knew as time went on, it would, those questions of whether or not I could pull it off again would really haunt me. Did both that book, the new book and um, Fleischman, were those ideas you had, I mean, did you kind of have that whole idea for Fleischman in your head from the beginning? Like, did you know the, how it ended? No, I knew this. I knew that I should write a book about the fact that all of my friends are getting divorced and that now they're dating in this radically different way. And that just at this point, the, the real thing that inspired me wasn't even that. It was, it was the fact that I had turned 40 and I was feeling like I was old, like I was living in New Jersey and like, you know, I was wearing leggings all the time. And I was just, I was like, I guess this is it for me. And I had these friends who were my exact same age who seemed so young, who thought they were young. They're like out there having sex every night with strangers and which is young person behavior. And the, the book came from this question of, am I older? Am I young? I don't know. Um, and so the thing I knew was that I wanted to examine that, but I knew that I could examine that for a thousand pages and that I needed a plot. And so I said, what if this guy is divorced? What if this divorced guy's wife is terrible? The other thing I noticed when people were telling me about their divorces was this, that all the men, when I said, what happened? They'd say, oh, she was so angry all the time and I couldn't take it anymore. And I'd ask the women, what happened? And they would say, I was so angry all the time and he never asked me why. <laughs> oh, wow. And it, it seemed to me fairly, like a fairly interesting dynamic of, to be examined. Um, so I felt like it was a good plot. You would have him drop her, drop the kids off. And then I spent a long time trying to figure out where she was. Like after I thought of that plot, I didn't know where she was. And it was maybe two drafts before I understood where she had to be. Um, and this new book was born of like a kind of, uh, like the kind of wounds I have over money, like the, the, uh, the obsession I have over money and the way that it is, that it seems impossible for successful people in my generation to advance unless they have an inheritance um, or, or some really profound kind of financial help that like the thing they're saying about the disappearing middle class is true that it used that, that my parent, if for my parents, if they worked hard, they would, they could become people of means if the, even if they had nothing, right? Like, uh, you and I know a million people whose whose fathers were immigrants and and opened a factory or or whatever it is and are now doing well. Whereas now you could really be at the top of your industry, and all your ex all all that you actually get in this country anymore is the opportunity to work more. You don't really get the things that the generation ahead used to. And so that is what the next book is about. It's about the kind of bewilderment of my generation's, um, my generation's understanding that, 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 that wealth has been hoarded and we're kind of screwed. Um, we have a few more minutes before. Um, Great before questions, but I just wanted to ask you a little bit, I know you probably answered this question a lot, 
but I want to know a little bit about your trajectory, like how, when you realized you wanted to write, I know you went to Tish for screenwriting. I did. I went to Tish for screenwriting. And, um, and then became a journalist and then a novelist and then a screenwriter. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, and um, of course, writing is writing, but I just wanted yeah. to, I just wanted to hear your story about how that, what that you trajectory know, I, don't, I don't remember knowing that I wanted to write. I remember a lot of people calling me a writer. And I, I also like remember, a, what? Like in school, you mean? Like, no, like my, like, like my parents saying like, ah, oh, she's a writer. Like the way you spoke, the way you observe things or. Yeah. Or like, maybe I would write things. And I know that I really loved English class and I had a mean teacher in 11th grade or 12th grade that whenever I was, I made money in 12th grade by writing other people's college essays. And she what? said, she, yeah. And she said to me, you know, it's not that you shouldn't do, she found out and she said, it's not that you shouldn't do this because it's not ethical. It's that you shouldn't do this because you're, you're not good enough to do this. And it was like a dagger. But then I had a boyfriend who was going to Tish at, to be a screenwriter or a director. And it enraged me that he, that no one along the way, that you could do something as audacious and, and confident as say, no, yes, I'm going to do this. Whereas I always thought if I did it, I would fall into it. And I followed, like, it's funny, it's like a story of confidence, but I followed a boy to NYU and I never saw him again in there. <laughs> I saw him a lot of years later, but, but I got a degree in screenwriting and right out of college, I, um, I got a job at a soap opera magazine. That is how I became a journalist, wow. is that I got what I thought was like a hilarious job at a soap <laughs> opera magazine. And I worked at two different soap opera magazines, one year and then the next year. And, I, and they thought I was terrible too. Like there was no validation for me along the way. They were like, ugh, I don't think you're, like you're not cut out for this. And I don't know why I never gave up. Like I guess something in me didn't think that I could do anything else. Like, or that like, I don't know. It's, it's such a blur to me that I can't figure out how I ever got to the point where I just continued doing it. Like, I wish I could because I would like to write it down for other young women and, or young men who, who are staring down the barrel of many years of not knowing if this bet works out. But I have to tell you, it was so ziggy and zaggy. And meanwhile, my friends were becoming doctors and lawyers. And, and they had so much laid out for them. Like, first you would clerk, and then you would intern, and then you were a junior associate, and then you were a partner. And I was like, you're just set? Like, that's it? And there was nothing like that for me. There was no community. There was no mentorship. There was no anything like that. And I got lucky that I was tenacious and that also I didn't want to be in a position where I worked for in an office for other people, which is ironic because I work at the New York Times now. But I, I work there very much on my own. Like I, I came there as someone who who was established enough that I'm I'm not running around the world taking on every assignment yeah so I guess that's my trajectory and as much as like there's yeah. nothing there there's nothing you could learn from that like, like but screenwriting when you studied screenwriting was that sort of just uh by default was that the program that you apply that you because I to? loved movies mm -hmm. I loved television in fact before the, the one thing I can say is before there was peak tv I was saying that t like TV is, is either should be or will be, or help, let me help make it better. Um, but of course I didn't do that. I instead waited till TV was already good 
sold a novel and now <laughs> and making TV that is, I hope, as good as the other TV that is out there because there's a lot of good TV out there. I can't wait to, uh, I can't wait to see it. Thank you. Um, so Julie. Yes. Do you, have you, how do we do this? Do yeah, I mean, I will, I can go in and, and monitor and read the questions out if you'd like. Okay. Great. Sure. Excellent. Okay, so everybody that wants to can turn their um, videos on now so that um, Taffy can see your faces if she would like to, to do everybody. that. Everybody can pop in. Um, I'm going to give a couple of the comments that came in just recently, um, and then I'll get up to the first question. But Holly said, I was told I could never do the career I wanted to. Very little else lights a fire like that, which I think right. is true. And then... Um, I'm going to mess up people's names, so sorry, I'm not even going to say them, because I, I would rather not say them than mess them up. <laughs> and she, uh, this person wrote, I wrote somebody else's homework too, and she got a B minus in journalism. That cemented it for her. <laughs> so a couple of fun comments. So let's start with the first question. It's a little sure. long, so bear with me here. Okay. So have you found that men appreciate your book as much as women do? It's a subversively, it, it is subversively feminist. It sneaks up on you. And I'm guessing men might not find it to be quite as much fun and amazing as women do. Not that I really care what men think about it, smiley face. Just wondering <laughs> if you, <laughs> just wondering if you've noticed a more lukewarm response from men. No, I actually, I, I more women are, more women have reached out to me, which may be just a thing you do, but men, like, first of all, I worked at GQ long enough to know a male compliment very often, which is like, I'm pretty impressed, God. like that I, that I had to live up to a kind of, um, an expectation. So, thank you. I'm so, I'm so glad you're impressed, but <laughs> I've had a lot of divorced men, like more than a few write to me and say, I did not understand my divorce and now I do. And that is like, uh, <laughs> I don't like, <laughs> um, I'm so glad to hear that. But there are, a, I, it might be because I, I, um, I wrote a lot for in, in sports and I wrote a lot, like my name might be associated with a certain kind of male content by now but I feel like I did hear from a lot of men. They, they, the feminist message of it did not set them on fire, but other things did. Um, although a couple of them would uniformly say that they could not find a way to forgive the person at the end who needs forgiving. I don't want to give too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, yeah, because that's the thing is, and it's really, that's the thing that, you know, we saw a lot of books at the store and, and having a book that resonates with men that's written by, I love it. It's just like, it's yay. <laughs> I love that. No, it has a very kind of muscular cover. It's a great cover. They tried to put emojis on them. And I said, I don't think that that's, I like, I don't, I, my kids will read it. Right. And I think my kids shouldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Right. <laughs> right. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Can I say, now that I can see everyone, can I just say hello to my father who is here, uh, who last night I was at an event and he was a little bit upset that I said I was raised by a single mother. I was also <laughs> raised on weekends by a single father. So please forgive me, dad. Hello. And hi. There's there's, I see him. He's waving at you. Okay. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm sorry, the next question. <laughs> That's what's fun about these rooms. It's like you can see everybody. <laughs> it's a fun, I, it's like a being in a party. I can talk and he's muted. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh -huh. not unmute. <laughs> okay, so the next question is a um, little long too, so bear with me here. I also felt like this is a port noise comp complaint of our time. Are you happy to be compared to Philip Roth or kind of grossed out? Personally, I feel it's a huge compliment. I feel like it's a huge compliment. He, so Philip Roth was a 
a profound influence in my life, um, especially when I was young, before I realized, and what I was saying last night that got me into trouble with my father was that I was raised by women, by like in a woman's household. I had three sisters. I went to girls' schools. I had a father who did not wish we were sons. Is that good, dad? Is that, is that you know, that's accurate, He's right? <laughs> He's, he, um, I did not know that, that there was such a thing as true misogyny until I was much older. And even then I was like, is this misogyny or is this a guy who just is vexed by sexuality? And I've come around obviously to, oh, no, 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 this is, <laughs> this is misogyny. But I feel like uh, you could, like he is an, uh, he was an electric writer who, made a huge difference in my life by narrating a kind of secular Jewish experience that I didn't see anybody else doing without um, getting into religiousness, right? And his anger and his, his sentences, his like 75 word sentences, those were the first things I read after the babysitter's club. I'm not kidding. Like my sister had them and they were there and I was like, I'll read this. And I, and I feel like I understood why you would sit in a room. If there was a TV and there were people and there were, uh, there were sports outside to do, why you would choose a book was because of this. And every time I could tell you like all over the map, where I was when I read one of his stories. In fact, I, um, the last family trip before my sisters all got married, um, we took was to Nice, was to the south of France. And I had picked up American Pastoral at the airport. And I, I couldn't look up. I don't know anything about the south of France. I don't know, I don't, I can't, I can't describe anything about any of it because all I did was read that book. And I, I would give anything for that experience as a reader. Like that's the experience I want to not put something down. And Absolutely. so thank you. I take it as a great compliment. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Lori. <laughs> okay, so, um, and we're getting lots of questions in, so we'll get to as many as we can, but if we don't get to yours, sorry, we'll try, we'll do our best. Okay, so the next one is, do you think there's a possibility of writing a woman the same way you've written a man? Do I think there is a way? Okay. So I think men and women have different freedom in the world. And so I think they sound, I, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm obviously generalizing, um, but yes. And in my next book, I, I write, a woman that my editor has said it like it, it feels like like she takes up the space of a man which I also don't know if that means I got it right because I, I, I mean I'm 44 I am in a generation where women the last generation I hope where women have to do something really kind of outrageous to take up the same space as men um, like see, like see my career for example like you know, see my smutty book, for example. Um, but I do think that you can do it. I, I am left with the question that if writing a book is a numbers game where, um, you know, you want as many people to read it as possible, what do you make of the fact that when I write a story at the Times about a woman, a bunch of people read it. And when I write about a man, everyone reads it. Um, so that's very, very cynical. But I guess the question I would ask is, is Fleischman, did I, did I not write about Libby the way I wrote about Toby? And I don't know. I think, it, I think the, in the end, she gets this same kind of treatment, albeit from a first person, that he does? I don't know, but that's such a good question. And I'll be thinking about it for like a week. <laughs> if you're on social media, you're probably going to have to like keep answering it, right? <laughs> Please, like find me. Let's talk about it. 
Okay, uh, next one coming in. Allison Krauss said that writing in a man's voice gave her book, History of Love, more gravitas and may have helped get it published. Agree or disagree? It's kind of the same sort of, to the same sort One of. million percent agree. Right. Look at my cover. Look at the um, amount of attention. Look at the people who reviewed it. Look at who I'm compared to. You would never get that if the, if the story was about uh, was about a woman you just can you think of a time even like I think of like other other women writers who do this like Donna Tart always writes about men I, I don't know if you if anyone else like please put in the chat an example you could think of that I can't but absolutely like I'll tell you a funny story a couple of weeks ago someone for some website someone started a website that's like it's, I'm going to put two people against each other who dis, who have different points of view on one topic. And they asked me if I wanted to write something defending the novel. Um, is the novel dead, right? And I was like, the novel dead? Like my novel is doing great. What's like, it's coming out in paperback next week. What's What's wrong with you? And I said, who is it that you would like me to speak with? I don't remember his name. I should remember his name. I should look it up right now and make sure you all know what it is. And out him. <laughs> it was a guy, it's a guy who recently wrote a thing saying there hasn't been a good novel since the corrections. That the novel is no longer a cultural, I know, every woman, um, it was like, like no Sit back and go what he, he doesn't even like he's supposed to be a public intellectual and he doesn't understand that that he doesn't understand that the woman that women's dominance over the form is not the same as it going down the tubes right. I'm not a public intellectual I was kicked out of high school like three times and I can tell you that that if you were to just look at st some statistics you could see that that, you know, like men have said a lot of great things over a lot, a lot of years and a lot of pages about the male experience. And it is a really interesting time now to, to be a woman and to, and to finally have a say that to finally, for, for the publishing industry to know that it's, it's, it's women who read I mean Julie who are your customers there are men here and I so hello to the men here um and a lot of men are great readers but it is a known thing that women are readers and the fact that women have been forced to read men's stories for so long is a little outrageous um and that the our stories come in these pastel covers with a headless body on them oh, and 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 i think that i think that it is impossible i think this question these questions are impossible because you don't know if you're betraying your gender by saying no i don't want i don't want that cover i want the cover with the city on it like i don't know it's un it's unprecedented i just know what I was raised reading and what I like to read. And I wrote the book that I like, but I will say this, that there was not, when I was trying to figure out where Rachel was, only now is, does it seem obvious to me where she was the whole time. And that is like my own internalized misogyny, I guess, that like, I didn't set out to write that, the book that I wrote, it's that when I handed in the book that I wrote, my editors who understand my experience so well said to me, like, isn't there more to this story? And I was very grateful for it. Well, and it go, going back to the covers, and I, I, I want to get to people say, it, it's almost I, I want to be blank covers on books because I want to be able to read a book and just read that person's writing. Good, bad, you know, because a cover really? can tell. I, I want to know. I mean, Jay had Jay said at the beginning, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. There is a very, very moneyed industry of for sure covers. Like, oh the, no, I don't for know. Sure. If you said you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. You're definitely supposed to judge a book by its cover. That's what book covers are. They. But are I think that sometimes people get buy them. But I think sometimes people get prejudiced by a cover. 
and they may not but read only something. In the right way. Like I felt this is what I kept saying because writers are pretentious. I kept saying, <laughs> I don't think this uh I don't think this cover sees the soul of my book. Like I don't think it like this cover with emojis or this cover with um there was one really weird one with like a, a mud flap girl on it. Oh. Which I, I still don't even know what to make of <laughs> what like how that wow. happened. But I think they were like, we don't know what to do with this. <laughs> and, the, and, and there was one that was just text messages, like you up, mm. question mark. And I was like, oh, and there are 72 young adult novels right now with that cover. Like, what, what, is, the, what is going on? Yeah. And the truth is, do you know what I did? I asked, I asked my editor to take my name off the book and resubmit it to a designer and that's how I got this title. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes. That, now I'm pulling my chin up. Yeah. Yeah. Nice okay. Okay. Still a thing. Right? But then again, the re there's so many people in the market in 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 like um in whatever the field of study is of this that like we maybe is it that we like turquoise from the womb like i don't understand like are we what is it about us <laughs> that 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 loves emoji i don't like whatever the headless woman right i don't know i just don't know i just know that like i i just know that it's really hard to know how to be a leader in this do you know what i mean yes. i don't know i don't always know what i should be fighting for to be heard like a man or to be heard Right, like woman. Because yeah, oh, it's a t yeah. That's a that's yeah. that's one of those lines that's kind of. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna we're gonna do two we're gonna do two more <laughs> we're gonna do two more questions because we're running right up against the hour here. So, sure. um, I love this book so much from the first sentence. I'm also a tall girl and have a long history with the confused short Jewish men. I wish. <laughs> Is there I any? Wish, Girl, is there any other kind? <laughs> I was shocked when my mother had a very different reaction to the storyline. I think this is a generational thing. Did you find that different generations reacted wildly differently to the book? I found that very young people did not necessarily understand why it was structured the way it was, because for good, re like for happy reasons, because they're like, why can't a woman tell her own story? So um, I'm very happy for very young women. Um, but no, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, of the old, the, the older people I know, my mother just thought it was too dirty, but she's my mother. And I, and I can't, I don't think so. I think a lot of older people liked it those are the people who tend to come like did the philip roth comparisons and i think but i think it like right uh, like got people my age like i think i i yeah yeah tell your mother i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> and one of our one of our watchers is i'm a short jewish doctor but even i found this book interesting <laughs> okay so our last question i have sure. a question about taffy's writing for the new york times Sure. You have a very distinct style, and I always look for your byline. Your celebrity you. profiles are always enthralling. You always write them in first person, and as a journalist, we're always trained not to do that. Yes. What made you decide to do that, and did you initially receive any pushback from your editors? I, what made me decide to do that is the same thing that made me decide to do it in the book, is that I always feel like why should you pretend that somebody isn't telling you this story? Mm -hmm. I guess it's just the way I feel that like, you know, my husband's a journalist and I hear him on the phone and he asks like very rigorous, um, fancy sounding questions. And he writes stories where he says, and he's basically horrified by what I do. But I think that like, I think it is a time where we stop pretending that ob objectivity is something we can achieve, whereas fairness is something we absolutely can achieve. And I guess the, the way I figured out how to do it was first of all, by re I was reading all this GQ 
and that was the house style. But second, I, what I felt like was that it is important that the reader understand my process for processing the information. And maybe I've never found a way, a more elegant way to do it. Like I think there are better writers than I am who let the, who, who don't need to do that to show their work. And I'm not one of them. Although luckily people seem to like that and they don't think of it as a deficit. So don't, don't tell anyone, don't tell my boss. <laughs> well, on that note, we all think you're a fabulous writer. <laughs> so. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming in. Thank you, Jay, so much. Jay. You are wonderful. Jay, that was a fantastic interview. Thank you. We so appreciate you taking your time, taking the time to do that. Um, for, I, I think somebody, Jay, you might've said this, um, I'm jealous for all of you that haven't read this book for the first time. It's such a treat to read this for the first time. Um, thank Taffy, you, we Julie. cannot wait for the next one. Thank and you. And thank you to you and to Warwick's and I appreciate it. I appreciate all you coming and buying the book and thank you to my father yeah. and Lois for coming. Hi, Lois. Yes. All right. Bye everybody. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thank you.